This module will look at the service design stage. The purpose of the service design stage of the life cycle is to design IT services, together with the governing IT practices, processes and policies, to realise the service provider's strategy and to facilitate the introduction of these services into supported environments, ensuring quality service delivery, customer satisfaction and cost-effective service provision. The scope of the service design stage of the life cycle is to offer guidance and advice on what areas should be considered when designing IT services for the current usage, as well as the future. To ensure the purpose and objectives of the service are defined, documented and agreed, the service design stage produces one major deliverable, namely a document called the service design package. This is a major document used for every new, modified and retired service and is used in other stages of the service life cycle. We will discuss this in more detail later. The objectives should include taking a holistic approach to the design of the service, factoring in current and future requirements, so that the need to update and align the service with business need should be kept to a minimum. It would be totally unrealistic to assume that a service will never need updating or changing in the future. To ensure that the right changes are applied, you will need to ensure that the right metrics are designed into the service to allow for continual improvement opportunities to be identified. These opportunities may be driven by business pressures or trends, indicating some efficiency that could be gained. It is imperative when designing a service that a holistic, results-driven approach to all aspects of design is adopted, and that when changing or amending any of the individual elements of design, all other aspects are considered. The message is very clear. All aspects involved in service provision must be considered. By adopting the five aspects of service design, this will ensure not only that the functional elements are addressed by the design, but also that all of the management and operational requirements. Incomplete designs could exclude these essential supporting elements, and including them as part of the design retrospectively may have serious quality consequences. Let us consider the following example when describing the five aspects of service design. Imagine that you are an internet service provider. You wish to offer a new product to your customers, enabling them to store data using your new cloud-based service. To ensure a complete service design, the five aspects could be used as follows. The service solution should record each service functional requirements. These should be analyzed, documented and agreed, and a solution design should then be produced. Consider our example. These functional requirements could include the ability to rename a folder or the ability to email a colleague from the cloud service. Each individual service solution design should also be considered in conjunction with each of the other four aspects of service design. Having identified the functional requirements, the next aspect is the service management system and tools. Examples would include the service catalog and the service portfolio. These tools are as important to the service design and the solution requirements. As our service will need to be hosted, we will need to consider the technology architecture and management systems required to operate our service. In the context of our example, what servers and what operating systems are required to run the service and supporting service management tools. We will also need to ensure that all required processes for operating and delivering the service have been considered. These are reviewed to ensure that the processes, roles, responsibilities and skills have the capability to operate, support and maintain the service. In the context of our example, do we have a process for password reset and do we have a process for backup and restore would be key concerns. The final considerations are the metrics necessary to enable us to monitor how effective the service is performing, but also to show areas of improvement. It may be that our measurement method may also require some amendment.
During the service design stage of the life cycle, everything needed to transition and operate the new or changed service is documented in a service design package. This life cycle stage also designs everything needed to create, transition and operate the services. The service design package is a key deliverable from the service design stage of the life cycle. There are a number of sections in the service design package which reflect the journey across other life cycle stages, service transition and service operation that the document takes. Many designs, plans and projects fail through a lack of preparation and management. The implementation of IT service management as a practice is about preparing and planning the effective and efficient use of the four P's. The four P's represent the four key areas of consideration when designing a service. They include people. Who will be involved on the demand side of the service as users or customers and those who work on the supply side such as providers. Both sides need consideration in service design. Processes. Currently used directly and indirectly in providing the service. Again, we should consider both the demand and supply sides. Products, i.e. the technology and tools that are used in conjunction with and or in support of the service provision. And finally, partners. Suppliers, manufacturers and vendors who have a role to play in the provision and support of the service. Within the service design stage of the service life cycle, there are eight processes. They are design coordination, service catalog management, service level management, capacity management, availability management, IT service continuity management, supplier management, and information security management. We will discuss these processes in more detail over the remaining lessons of this module. The service design stage is a complex stage with many activities of a detailed nature. As discussed earlier, a holistic approach to service design should be adopted and this can only be achieved by taking thorough, well-coordinated actions during design. Only then can a service provider hope to create service designs that are both comprehensive and appropriate and will support the achievement of the required business outcomes. The purpose of design coordination in this respect is pivotal and is defined as ensuring that the goals and objectives of the service design stage are met by providing and maintaining a single point of coordination and control for all activities and processes within this stage of the service life cycle. By acting as a coordinator for the stage, this process should seek to ensure that a consistent approach is adopted when considering service management systems and tools, the architectures that they operate within and on, the supporting processes to be used, and the metrics being used and required to demonstrate service effectiveness. As a coordinating process, there needs to be coordinated planning of the resources and activities required to design and potentially build the service. An essential product of the service design stage is the production of a service design package. The design coordination process is responsible for ensuring this is produced. Design coordination also acts as fulcrum for ensuring a smooth handover from service strategy, where the value of a service is identified, to service transition, where that value manifests itself as a deployed service. The activities that are performed as part of the service design stage can, and will, over time, be improved. It is design coordination's responsibility to ensure this happens in a coordinated style. This improvement can be best achieved by a common framework of service design practice wherever possible. The scope of design coordination extends as far as supporting all service design activities and processes in service design projects. To ensure that appropriate policies and guidelines are in place or all service design activities. 
Resource management across service design activities, including the resolution of any current resource conflicts, as well as planning future resource requirements. Finally, the process should include improvement opportunities across the stage. Consider the following example. You wish to find out from your local council the opening and closing times of a recycling centre. You naturally view the council's website. You gain useful information regarding the recycling service. How would you find information on environmental services, or local night schools or local amenities such as parks, or indeed services you are as yet unaware of? You would visit the website of your council. But in actual fact, you would be viewing the Council's service catalogue. When looking to provide a comprehensive approach to service provision, the service catalogue is one of the most valuable elements that can be utilised. The service catalogue management processes a single consistent source of information on all live or operational services that can be consumed or purchased now or are imminent. That is, they are being prepared to be live or operational and will be available for consumption or purchase in the near future. The objectives of service catalogue management are, as you would expect, focused on the contents of and the management of the service catalogue. This includes ensuring that the catalogue contains accurate information on all live and soon-to-be live services including any dependencies that exist, as well as any interfaces, are clearly identified. In some organisations, access to the service catalogue may be restricted to specific individuals. The service catalogue management process is to ensure that this access is applied correctly within the business. Finally, the process should also ensure that it supports the needs of other service management processes in terms of information, dependencies and interfaces as they evolve and mature within the organisation. Naturally, the scope of service catalogue management as a process will be all services that have or are in the process of being transitioned to the live environment. The manner in which services are presented in the catalogue can vary, depending upon organisational need or preference. To make the service catalogue easier to navigate and avoid any confusion, it may be useful to define a hierarchy of services by qualifying exactly what type of service is recorded. The most valuable distinction is between those services that are customer-facing and, as the description implies, are seen by the customer. These are services that typically support the customer's business units, business processes, in order to directly facilitate some outcome or outcomes desired by the customer. The other distinction is for those services that are supporting services that support or underpin the customer-facing services. These are typically invisible to the customer, but essential to the delivery of customer-facing IT services. It is best practice to present more than one view of the information in the service catalogue to meet the different needs of those who will use it. To ensure that the customer and IT both have a clear view of the relationship between the customer-facing services and the business processes they support, it is recommended that a service provider should present two different views of the catalogue. Each one should focus on one type of service, a view for customers that shows the customer-facing services. A second view for the IT service provider should show all the supporting services. Some organisations may present more than two views of the service catalogue. The number of views presented will be as the provider's needs and the needs of customers dictate. This may be, for example, based upon the audiences to be addressed and the uses to which the catalogue will be put. A three-view display may consist of the following views. A wholesale customer view containing details of the IT services delivered to wholesale customers together with relationships to the customers they support. In the example of a telecoms provider, this may be the view shown to business customers. A retail customer view containing details of all the IT services delivered to retail customers, 
together with relationships to the customers they support. Keeping with the example of a telecoms provider, this may be the view shown to domestic or personal customers. Finally, a supporting services view will be required, containing details of all the supporting IT services, together with any relationships to the customer-facing services that they underpin, together with any essential components and other supporting services required to support the provision of the service. Service level management is a vital process for every IT service provider organization in that it is responsible for agreeing and documenting service level targets and responsibilities within service level agreements, SLAs, and service level requirements, SLRs, for every service and related activity within IT. If these targets are appropriate and accurately reflect the requirements of the business, then the service delivered by the service providers will align with business requirements and meet the expectations of customers and users in terms of service quality. The SLA is effectively a level of assurance or warranty with regard to the level of service quality delivered by the service provider for each of the services delivered to the business. The purpose of the service level management process is to ensure that all current and planned IT services are delivered to agreed achievable targets. This is accomplished through a constant cycle of negotiating, agreeing, monitoring, reporting on and reviewing IT service targets and achievements, and through instigation of actions to correct or improve the level of service delivered. There are seven core activities that make up the process. They are define, document, agree, monitor, measure, report and review the level of IT services provided and where appropriate instigate corrective measures. To provide and improve the relationship and communication with the business and customers in conjunction with business relationship management. To ensure that specific and measurable targets are developed for all IT services to monitor and improve customer satisfaction with the quality of service delivered, to ensure that IT and the customers have a clear and unambiguous expectation of the level of service to be delivered, and finally, to ensure that even when all agreed targets are met, the levels of service delivered are subject to proactive, cost-effective, continual improvement. The scope of the service includes providing a point of contact and source of communications to the customer and business in relation to service levels, representing the business to the IT service provider and the IT service provider to the business, reviewing supplier contracts with supplier management, negotiating and agreeing future and current service level requirements, SLRs, and targets, SLTs, Developing, managing and reviewing SLAs and supporting OLAs and review of supporting underpinning contracts. Instigating and coordinating a service improvement program. Let us consider the following example when describing how the process works. An internet service provider is looking to extend their service offering to customers to include online storage. A number of documents will be required and a number of supporting considerations planned for also. A service level agreement or SLA is a document written in clear business language between an IT service provider and a business or customer. In providing the service to customers, the provider may need to rely on certain internal functions or department to support the new storage service. In this example, we will assume the service desk will play a key role in delivering the service. This aspect of the service provision will be documented at a technical level in a document called an Operational Level Agreement, or OLA. The service will also be dependent upon a third-party telecoms provider to deliver access to the service. This aspect of service provision will be managed by the supplier management process. However, service level management will need to review any underpinning contracts that are in place to ensure they are appropriate and supportive of the level of service being agreed to in the SLA.
As we mentioned earlier, one of the objectives of service level management is to define, document and agree the level of IT service to be provided. To achieve this, service level management must design the most appropriate SLA structure to ensure that all services and all customers are covered in a manner best suited to the organization's needs. There are a number of potential frameworks which we will discuss in this section. The first framework is the service-based SLA. Consider your internet service provision. If you and friends obtain your broadband services from the same supplier, you will more than likely have the same terms and conditions in your contract. This is an example of a service-based SLA where the one SLA covers the engagement with more than one customer of the same service. The second framework to consider is the customer-based SLA. This is an agreement with an individual customer covering all the services they use. In this example, there is more than one service being consumed by the customer, the terms of which can be captured in one SLA. To enable an organization to achieve the benefits of both a service-based and customer-based SLA, a multi-level structure may be more appropriate. The corporate level will cover all the generic service level management issues appropriate to every customer throughout the organization. These issues are likely to be less volatile, so updates are less frequently required. An example may be the response time to large print requests, for example a standard 4-hour response window. The customer level will cover all SLM issues relevant for certain departments when it comes to handling print jobs. To the particular customer group or business unit, regardless of the service being used. An example may be a higher level of service. Taking the print example further, this may mean a two-hour response window for the accounts department. At the service level, all SLM issues relevant to the specific service will be covered. In relation to a specific customer group, one for each service covered by the SLA. Taking our printing example further, this may mean a tighter response time. For example, at month end, this may mean a one-hour response time for trial balance or sales purchase ledger reports. What does an SLA look like? The contents will vary depending upon the nature and levels of service a customer wishes to consume. Each SLA should be defined and documented with the following as minimum contents. A simple clear description of the service and the deliverables expected by the customer. A statement of the agreed service hours and the response times that can be seen by the user. The incident response and resolution time that are expected to be delivered and should also be documented. If a degree of service change is included in the SLA, then the response time for changes should be documented. Service level targets or SLTs should be included for the service in respect of service availability, security and continuity. The respective customer and provider responsibilities should be detailed. The service reporting and reviewing activities and frequency. And finally, any critical business periods and exceptions, holidays, peaks, should be detailed and any provisions surrounding them. It should be noted that nothing should be included in an SLA unless it can be effectively monitored and measured at a commonly agreed point. The importance of this cannot be overstressed, as inclusion of items that cannot be effectively monitored almost always results in disputes and eventual loss of faith in the service level management process. Periodic reports must be produced and circulated to customers or their representatives and appropriate IT managers a few days in advance of service level reviews, so that any queries or disagreements can be resolved ahead of the review meeting. The periodic reports should incorporate details of performance against all SLA targets, together with details of any trends or specific actions being undertaken to improve service quality. A useful technique is to include an SLA monitoring SLAM, chart at the front of a service report to give an at-a-glance overview of how achievements have measured up against targets. 
These are most effective if colour coded. Green to show SLAs that are operating within agreed targets. Amber to demonstrate where challenges have occurred, yet the SLA is still intact, just. Finally, red to show where service level targets have been breached. These SLAM charts are also referred to as RAG charts. The final core activity is the service review. Review meetings must be held on a regular basis with customers or their representatives to review the service achievement in the last period and to preview any issues for the coming period. It is normal to hold such meetings monthly or as a minimum quarterly. There are a number of other processes that will communicate directly with service level management. With the service strategy stage of the life cycle, the business relationship management process ensures that the service provider has a full understanding of the needs and priorities of the business and that customers are appropriately involved or represented in the work of service level management. Financial management for IT services works with service level management to validate the predicted cost of delivering the service levels required by the customer to inform their decision-making process and to ensure that actual costs are compared with predicted costs as part of the overall management of the cost effectiveness of the service. All other seven service design processes will interact starting with service catalogue management. This process provides accurate information about services and their interfaces and dependencies to support, determining the SLA framework, identifying customers and business units that need to be engaged by service level management to assist in communicating with customers regarding services provided. The availability, capacity, IT service continuity and information security management processes contribute to service level management by helping to define service level targets that relate to their area of responsibility and to validate that the targets are realistic. Once targets are agreed, the day-to-day -day operation of each process ensures achievements match targets. Supplier management works collaboratively with service level management to define, negotiate, document and agree terms of service with suppliers to support the achievement of commitments made by the service provider in SLAs. Supplier management also manages the performance of suppliers and contracts against these terms of service to ensure related SLA targets are met. Design coordination is responsible for ensuring that the overall service design activities are completed successfully. Service level management plays a critical role in this through the development of agreed service level requirements and the associated service targets which the new or changed service must be designed to achieve. The final life cycle stage to work closely with service level management is service operation. The incident management process provides critical data to service level management to demonstrate performance against many SLA targets, as well as operating with the fulfilment of SLA targets as a critical success factor. Service level management negotiates support-related targets such as target restoration times, and then the fulfilment of those targets is embedded into the operation of the incident management process. The purpose of the availability management process is to ensure that the level of availability delivered in all IT services meets the agreed availability needs and or service level targets in a cost-effective and timely manner. Availability management is concerned with meeting both the current and future availability needs of the business. Availability management defines, analyzes, plans, measures and improves all aspects of the availability of IT services, ensuring that all IT infrastructure, processes, tools and roles are appropriate for the agreed availability service level targets. It provides a point of focus and management for all availability related issues relating to both services and resources, ensuring that availability targets in all areas are measured and achieved. The objectives of availability management are to 
Ensure that an up-to-date availability plan is produced and maintained to reflect the current and future needs of the business. When required, to provide advice and guidance on all availability-related issues to all other areas of the business and IT. To ensure that service availability achievements meet all their agreed targets by managing services and resources related availability performance. To assist with the diagnosis and resolution of availability related incidents and problems. To assess the impact of all changes on the availability plan and the availability of all services and resources. To ensure that proactive measures are in place to improve the availability of services are implemented wherever it is cost justifiable to do so. Availability management should ensure the agreed level of availability is provided. The measurement and monitoring of IT availability is a key activity to ensure availability levels are being met consistently. The scope of availability management as a process is to cover the design, implementation, measurement, management and improvement of IT service and component availability. Availability management is involved as soon as the availability requirement for an IT service can be communicated. The process is ongoing and is completed when the IT service is decommissioned or retired. There are two key elements to the availability management process. Reactive activities involve the monitoring, measuring, analysis and management of all availability related events, incidents and problems. These activities are principally operational in nature. The proactive activities involve the planning, design and improvement of availability. These activities are principally performed as part of the design and planning roles. As mentioned previously, availability management should perform both reactive and proactive activities. The reactive aspect of availability management involves work to ensure that current operational services and components deliver the agreed levels of availability and to respond appropriately when they do not. The reactive activities include monitoring, measuring, analysing, reporting and reviewing service and component availability and investigating all service and component unavailability and instigating remedial action. This includes looking at events, incidents and problems involving unavailability. These activities are primarily conducted within the service operation stage of the service life cycle and are linked into the monitoring and control activities and incident management processes. The proactive activities of availability management involve the work necessary to ensure that new or changed services can and will deliver the agreed levels of availability and that appropriate measurements are in place to support this work. They include producing recommendations, plans and documents on design guidelines and criteria for new and changed services and the continual improvement of service and reduction of risk in existing services wherever it can be cost justified. These are key aspects to be considered within service design activities. Proactive activities include involvement in the planning and design of new services or changes to existing services to address what constitutes a vital business function within the business what availability requirements there are from the business for a new or changed IT service, what targets should be included in the SLAs, OLAs and underpinning contracts for service availability, reliability and maintainability, and what risk assessment and management activities need to be performed on a regular basis. Risk assessment and management activities will determine the impact on an IT service due to service and or component failure and working with IT service continuity management review the availability design criteria to minimise business impact. Where feasible cost justifiable countermeasures should be implemented including risk reduction and recovery mechanisms. Reviewing all new and changed services and testing all availability and resilience mechanisms. 
Continual improvement opportunities should always be included and prioritised in the availability plan to improve IT service availability. The reports and plans that are produced as part of the availability management process should be stored in the Availability Management Information System, which is a repository of availability-related information and could be an electronic store or possibly a physical store, such as a LeverArch file. There are four key targets that relate to availability management. They are best remembered by the acronym ARMS, which stands for Availability, Reliability, Maintainability and Serviceability. The first target which is included in the SLA is the Service Availability. This is calculated as shown as being the agreed service time less any unexpected downtime. Planned maintenance should be factored into agreed service time. To help explain the targets for reliability and maintainability, let us look at the following example. A service is currently available within agreed service targets. An interruption occurs which brings a service down. The service is restored and stays up for a number of hours. A further interruption brings it down again for a short spell. So there we have the life of an IT service. The reliability of the service is a measure of how long a service, component or configuration item can perform its agreed function without interruption. It is often measured and reported as the mean time between failures, or MTBF. Maintainability is a measure of how quickly and effectively a service, component or CI can be restored to normal working after a failure. It is measured and reported as the mean time to restore service, or MTRS. MTRS should be used to avoid the ambiguity with the more common industry term mean time to repair, MTTR, which in some definitions includes only repair time. The downtime in MTRS covers all the contributory factors that make the service, component or CI unavailable, and all the activities required to restore the service. Serviceability is the ability of a third-party supplier to meet the terms of its contract. This contract will include agreed levels of availability, reliability and or maintainability for a supporting service or component. The key service target contained within SLAs for customers and the business is availability. Some customers also require reliability and maintainability targets to be included in the SLA as well. Where these are included, they should relate to end-to-end -end service reliability and maintainability. The purpose of the capacity management process is to ensure that the capacity of IT services and the IT infrastructure meets the agreed capacity and performance related requirements in a cost effective and timely manner. Capacity management has several objectives. Firstly, it will produce and maintain an up-to-date capacity plan which is appropriate and reflects the current and future needs of the business. The process will also provide advice and guidance to all other areas of the business and IT on all capacity and performance related issues. It will ensure that service performance achievements meet all of their agreed targets by managing the performance and capacity of both services and resources. It will assist with the diagnosis and resolution of performance and capacity related incidents and problems, as well as assess the impact that changes could have on the capacity plan and the performance and capacity of all services and resources. Finally, where it is cost justifiable to do so, it will ensure that proactive measures to improve the performance of services are implemented. The capacity management process should be the focal point for all IT performance and capacity issues. Capacity management considers all resources required to deliver the IT service and plans for short, 
medium and long-term business requirements. This should support tuning activities to make the most efficient use of existing IT resources. By understanding the agreed current and future demands being made by the customer for IT resources, it should also be capable of producing more reliable forecasts for future requirements. All these activities lead towards the production of a capacity plan that enables the service provider to continue to provide services of the quality defined in SLAs and that covers a sufficient planning time frame to meet future required service levels. Some activities in the capacity management process are reactive whilst others are proactive. These activities will enable an organization to assess, agree and document new requirements and capacity, plan new capacity, review current capacity and performance, improve current service and component capacity. All capacity related information such as performance reports, forecasts and the current capacity should be stored as part of the capacity management information system which again could be an electronic or physical store. Capacity management can be an extremely technical, complex and demanding process and in order to achieve results it requires three supporting sub-processes business capacity management, service capacity management and component capacity management. The business capacity management sub-process translates business needs and plans into requirements for service and IT infrastructure, ensuring that the future business requirements for IT services are quantified, designed, planned and implemented in a timely fashion. This can be achieved by using the existing data on the current resource utilization by the various services and resources to trend, forecast, model or predict future requirements. The service capacity management subprocess focuses on the management, control and prediction of the end-to-end -end performance and capacity of the live operational IT services usage and workloads. It ensures that the performance of all services, as detailed in service targets within SLAs and SLRs, is monitored and measured, and that the collected data is recorded, analyzed and reported. Wherever necessary, proactive and reactive action should be instigated to ensure that the performance of all services meets their agreed business targets. The component capacity management subprocess focuses on the management, control and prediction of the performance, utilization and capacity of individual IT technology components. It ensures that all components within the IT infrastructure that have finite resource are monitored and measured and that the collected data is recorded, analyzed and reported. A capacity plan will be used by all areas of the business and IT management to plan the capacity of the IT infrastructure. The following headings are recommended content. Introduction Business scenarios will help put the plan into the context of the current and envisaged business environment. The scope, terms of reference section should explicitly name those elements of the IT infrastructure that are included and those that are excluded, if any. Methods used should contain details of how and when this information was obtained. Any assumptions made? Service summary. Resource summary. Options for service improvement. Costs forecast. Recommendations. The purpose of the IT service continuity management process is to support the overall business continuity management process. By ensuring that, by managing the risks that could seriously affect IT services, the IT service provider can always provide minimum agreed business continuity related service levels. This process represents IT's contribution to business continuity. In support of and alignment with the business continuity management process, IT service continuity management uses formal risk assessment and management techniques to reduce risks to IT services to agreed acceptable levels 
and to plan and prepare for the recovery of IT services. The objectives of ITSCM are to produce and maintain a set of IT service continuity plans that support the overall business continuity plans of the organisation. On a regular basis, business impact analysis exercises or BIA exercises need to be completed to ensure that all continuity plans are relevant to changing business requirements. Also on a regular basis, risk assessment and risk management exercises need to be conducted to ensure that IT services are managed within an agreed level of business risk in conjunction with the business and the availability management and information security management processes. Advice and guidance should be provided to all other areas of the business and IT on all continuity related issues and ensure that appropriate continuity mechanisms are put in place to meet or exceed the agreed business continuity targets. The impact of all changes on the IT service continuity plans should be assessed, as well as their supporting methods and procedures. Proactive measures to improve the availability of services should be implemented wherever it is cost justifiable to do so. Finally, the process should negotiate and agree contracts with suppliers for the provision of the necessary recovery capability to support all continuity plans, but always in conjunction with the supplier management process. The scope of the IT service continuity management process includes agreement on its scope and the policies adopted. Performing regular business impact analysis to quantify the impact that the loss of an IT service would have on the business. Effective risk assessment and risk management to identify potential threats to continuity and the probability of the threats becoming reality. Where cost justifiable, effective measures should be taken to manage the identified threats. The IT service continuity management lifecycle consists of four stages. The first two, initiation and, to a significant extent, the requirement stage, are principally business continuity activities. IT service continuity management should only be involved in these stages to support the business continuity activities and to understand the relationship between the business processes and the impacts caused on them by loss of IT service. Ascertaining the business requirements for IT service continuity is a critical component in order to determine how well an organisation will survive a business interruption or disaster and the cost that will be incurred. The purpose of business impact analysis is to assess and understand the impact to the business that loss of service would have. This impact could be a hard impact that can be precisely identified such as financial loss or soft impact, such as public relations, moral, health and safety, or loss of competitive advantage. The business impact analysis will identify the most important services to the organisation and will therefore be a key input to the strategy. The second driver in determining IT service continuity management requirements is the likelihood that a disaster or other serious service disruption will actually occur. This is an assessment of the level of threat and the extent to which an organisation is vulnerable to that threat. Risk assessment can also be used in assessing and reducing the chance of normal operational incidents. The results of the business impact analysis and the risk assessment will enable appropriate business and IT service continuity strategies to be produced in line with the business needs. Once the strategy has been approved, the detailed IT service continuity plans need to be produced in line with the business continuity plans, and the measures to implement the strategy need to be put in place. Risk reduction arrangements are usually undertaken in conjunction with availability management. Testing is a critical part of the overall IT service continuity management process and the only way of ensuring that the selected strategy, standby arrangements, logistics, business recovery plans and procedures will actually work in practice. 
Education, awareness and training ensures that all staff are aware of the implications of business and service continuity and are aware of their responsibilities within the scheme of continuity. Following the initial testing, it is necessary to establish a program of regular testing to ensure that the critical components of the strategy are tested, preferably at least annually and after every major business change which may affect plans. The change management process should ensure that all changes are assessed for their potential impact on the IT service continuity management plans. Invocation is the ultimate test of the business continuity and IT service continuity management plans. If all the preparatory work has been successfully completed and plans developed and tested, then an invocation of the business continuity plans should be a straightforward process. The purpose of the information security management process is to align IT security with business security and ensure that the confidentiality, integrity and availability of the organization's assets, information, data and IT services always matches the agreed needs of the business. The objective of information security management is to protect the interests of those relying on information and the systems and communications that deliver the information from harm, resulting from failures of confidentiality, integrity and availability. The scope of the information security management process should include the production, maintenance, distribution and enforcement of an information security policy and any supporting security policies. This can only be achieved by thoroughly understanding the agreed current and future security requirements of the business and the existing business security policy and plans. The process should also implement a set of security controls that support the information security policy and manage risks associated with access to services, information and systems. These controls should be documented together with the operation and maintenance of the controls and their associated risks. The process should manage any supplier's access to systems and services and any associated contracts in conjunction with supplier management as well as managing all security breaches, incidents and problems associated with all systems and services. There should also be a proactive improvement of security controls and security risk management and the reduction of security risks which involve integrating security aspects within all other IT service management processes. The information security management process will have a formal system to establish policy and objectives and to achieve those objectives. One key component that will support the process is an information security policy that can address each aspect of strategy, controls and regulation. The Information Security Management System, ISMS, provides a basis for the development of a cost-effective information security program that supports the business objectives. There are five elements within this structure. The objectives of the control element are to establish a management framework to initiate and manage information security in the organization, as well as an organizational structure to prepare, approve and implement the information security policy. The objective of the plan element of the information security management system, ISMS, is to devise and recommend the appropriate security measures based on an understanding of the requirements of the organization. The requirements will be gathered from such sources as business and service risk, plans and strategies, SLAs and OLAs, and the legal, moral and ethical responsibilities for information security. The information security policy defines the organization's attitude and stance on security matters. The information security policy should cover all areas of security and be appropriate to meet the needs of the business. It should include an overall information security policy, use and misuse of IT assets policy, an access control policy, a password control policy, an email policy, an internet policy, an antivirus policy, an information classification policy, a document classification policy, a remote access policy, 
a policy with regard to supplier access to IT service information and components. A copyright infringement policy for electronic material. An asset disposal policy. A records retention policy. The implementation element of the Information Security Management System, ISMS, ensures that appropriate procedures, tools and controls are in place to underpin the information security policy. Measures include ensuring there exists accountability for assets, information classification, information and repositories should be classified according to the sensitivity and the impact of disclosure. The evaluator element of the Information Security Management System, ISMS, checks for compliance with the security policy and security requirements in service level agreements and operational level agreements and in underpinning contracts in conjunction with supplier management regular audits performed on the technical security of IT systems as well as providing information to external auditors and regulators if required. The maintain element of the Information Security Management System ISMS, seeks to improve security agreements as specified in, for example, service level agreements and operational level agreements and improve the implementation of security measures and controls. This should be achieved using a PDCA Plan, Do, Check, Act cycle. In providing high-quality IT services, the complexity of provision and the breadth of skills and capabilities needed will necessitate that third-party suppliers be involved either directly or indirectly in the provision of those services. The purpose of the supplier management process is to obtain value for money from suppliers and to provide seamless quality of IT service to the business by ensuring that all contracts and agreements with suppliers support the needs of the business and that all suppliers meet their contractual commitments. The objectives of supplier management are focused on managing the relationship between the provider and supplier to ensure that best value for money is gained by the provider. One clear way of achieving this is to ensure that all underpinning contracts with suppliers are aligned with the needs of the provider's business and support any agreement, SLA or OLA, that the provider has arranged in support of the provision of a service. The scope of supplier management will be focused around all supplier management activities, namely maintaining an accurate supplier and contract management information system, SCMIS, ensuring that suppliers and contracts are categorised according to risk, strategic importance and performance, ensure that all contracts are reviewed, renewed and terminated accordingly, where improvement opportunities exist in the management of suppliers, these improvement opportunities are logged in the CSI register, where any contractual disputes arise, the process should also deal with them appropriately. Supplier management is a crucial component in supporting the service level management process. The supplier management process consists of a number of activities that are focused on ensuring that suppliers meet the terms, conditions and targets of their contracts while at the same time maximising the value for money obtained from suppliers. All supplier management process activity should be driven by a supplier strategy and policy formulated in service strategy. This defines the service provider's plan for how it will leverage the contribution of suppliers in the achievement of the overall service strategy. As part of the design of a new or changed service, the IT service provider will determine if and to what extent the contribution of suppliers will be required for a sound design and subsequent successful service provision. Once this decision has been made, the detailed requirements for new suppliers or new contracts with existing suppliers can be developed. When selecting a new supplier or contract, a number of factors need to be taken into consideration, such as the supplier's track record, their capabilities, their references, credit rating and size relative to the provider. 
The Supplier Contract Management Information System, or SCMIS, provides a single central repository of information for the management of all suppliers and contracts. When establishing new suppliers and contracts, adding them to the SCMIS needs to be handled via the change management process to ensure that any impact is assessed and understood. A key element of any supplier relationship is that the customer, in this case the business, is satisfied that the supplier is performing at an acceptable level that is in line with the contract between the parties. There should be regular contract reviews to ensure that each contract is continuing to satisfy business requirements. The supplier management process should be structured in such a way that there should be more time and effort spent on managing key suppliers than on those that are less important. To achieve this, a form of supplier categorization should exist. The Supplier Contract Management Information System is the single repository that contains details of the organization's suppliers, together with details of the products and services that they provide to the business. All information used and produced by all activities within the process should be initially accessed from the Supplier Contract Management Information System. Suppliers can be categorised in many ways, but one of the best methods for categorising suppliers is based on assessing the risk and impact associated with using the supplier, and the value and importance of the supplier and its services to the business. A commodity supplier is one that provides low-value, readily available products and services, which could be alternatively sourced relatively easily. An example would be stationary supplies or cleaning services. An operational supplier is one that provides operational products or services, an example of which would be internet service provision. A tactical supplier is one where the relationship involves significant commercial activity and business interaction, an example of which would include hardware maintenance organisation providing resolution of server hardware failures. A strategic supplier is where there are significant partnering relationships involving senior managers sharing confidential strategic information to facilitate long-term plans. An example of such a supplier would be a network service provider supplying worldwide network service and their support. Selecting and adopting the best practice as recommended in this publication will assist organizations in delivering significant benefits. With good service design, it is possible to deliver quality, cost-effective services and to ensure that the business requirements are being met consistently. Adopting and implementing standard and consistent approaches for service design will help to reduce the total cost of ownership or TCO. The cost of ownership can only be minimized if all aspects of services, processes and technology are designed properly and implemented against the design. Improve the quality of service. Both service and operational quality will be enhanced through services that are better designed to meet the required outcomes of the customer. Improve consistency of service. This will be achieved by designing services within the corporate strategy, architectures and constraints. Improve service performance. Service performance will be enhanced if services are designed to meet specific performance criteria and if capacity, availability, IT service continuity and financial plans are recognized and incorporated. Ease the implementation of new or changed services. Integrated and full service designs and the production of comprehensive service design packages will support effective and efficient transitions. Improve service alignment. The involvement of service design from the conception of the service will ensure that new or changed services align to the business needs and targets. Better IT governance. By building controls into designs, service design can contribute towards the effective governance of IT. Match business needs with services designed to meet service level requirements. This completes the lessons within this module. 
you should take the opportunity to reflect back against the module objectives. Consider whether these objectives have been met and whether you need to review any of the lessons. When you are comfortable with having completed the module learning, you can progress to the next module.